You know, you'd think that I would like winter more than I actually do. After all, as many of you know, I skate. I spend two hours or so a day in gloves and leg warmers gliding around on a sheet of ice. So I must surely love the cold and thus the winter, yes? I do not. I do not love winter. It is, in fact, my least favorite season. My favorite is autumn, then spring, then summer. Winter is last. Dead last, dead, barren, cold, winter last. Now, hate is an ugly word, so let's just say that I dislike winter strongly. Or at least, I dislike parts of it. Sure, there are some parts that I like, parts. For instance, I like snow, sort of. I like Thursday's snow from inside my nice, warm apartment. I enjoy looking out at it as it came down out there. I liked watching the snowflakes fall onto bare branches and rooftops. However, I did not like stepping out into it on Friday. I did not like finding my car covered in four inches of that nasty white mess when I tried to leave to go to the skating rink. I did not like having to scrape it off with first a snow brush, and then when that failed to be effective, to attempt to scrape it off with a figure skate. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> I didn't like the clumps of that awful, cold, wet stuff ending up inside of my skates and all over my hands and my arms and my leggings and my shoes as I slowly, laboriously shoved some of it but in the end, not all, off of my car. I disliked it so much, in fact, that as soon as my fingers and my toes started to get numb and hurt from the cold, I started imagining actually having to put my feet later into the now snow-filled skates. When I went to the rink, I finally decided, you know what? Who needs to practice? I don't need to go to the rink today. Who needs to be cold on purpose? I have a sermon to write. I might as well stay home, stay nice and warm and cozy, and get an early start on writing it. Now I know that some of you are with me on this. You're with me in thinking that winter is awful, and you are desperate for it to end and for spring to arrive. And I know that some of you aren't with me at all. I know that there are some of you who are folks who think that winter is wonderful. Three months of winter wonderland that you hope will never, ever end. And I know that many of you, perhaps most of you, are in between, that winter is nice for a while, but everything in its season, yes? So perhaps you're beginning to look ahead to the next season with hope and eagerness and anticipation, even as you continue to enjoy this one. Whatever each of us may feel about the season, this past Thursday's little wannabe snowstorm was an important reminder that, like it or not, it is still winter for about another month or so. Now, I'm a believer in making the best of things. And I don't even think that it is a mere mental task or a way of tricking myself into thinking that things are actually better than they are. I truly believe, as my UU colleague, the Reverend Meg Barnhouse, once said, I have the choice to stew about things or to be there for my life. She goes on to talk about Wendy Palmer's book, The Intuitive Body, wherein Palmer pointed out that you get what you pay for when it comes to your attention. Whatever you pay attention to, that is what you get. If you pay attention to the things that are nuisances, your life feels like one big nuisance. If you pay attention to beauty and joy, 
then your life fills up with beauty and joy. So okay, if you pay attention to nuisances like winter, like a ice skate full of snow, then your life is going to feel like that. It's going to feel like shoving your foot into a figure skate just completely chock full of nasty, wet, cold snow. But if you pay attention to the positive parts of winter, then life is going to feel a whole lot better. Even I have to admit that there are, in fact, many positive things about winter. You know that the world needs winter. We need winter. And I'm not just talking metaphorically either. I know many of us have been concerned by the early blooming of flowers in this season and what that might mean for climate change. We need winter. Now, I don't have much of a green thumb, but I do know that some seeds need to be exposed to cold if they are to sprout, to take root and to grow properly. Without old Jack Frost, there is no springtime sprouting and blooming for those plants. There just isn't. In fact, we may think of wintertime sometimes as a dormant time, as a dead, barren, frozen wasteland time. And yet, what we know is that when it comes to some seeds, cold temperatures are actually what ends dormancy and allows the seeds to begin to germinate. I'm reminded of our amaryllis bulbs, which we planted around this time two months ago to mark the new year. We passed them around in early winter. We gathered ourselves in as a community in this sanctuary in that cold morning and took turns holding the dry, brown, flaky, perhaps dead-seeming bulbs in our hands, thinking as we did of the things that we hoped would take root and grow within us this season. And look at them now. Just look at them over there in our window. Several of them are growing nice and vibrant over there in the windowsill. Even in the heart of winter, there is life and beauty and growth if you but nurture it and take the time just to look now and then. And yet, you will notice that they are each rising from the soil at their own pace. One sprouted weeks before the others and had 18 centimeters of leafy growth before the next one had even started to grow at all. Then the second, after a week or two of very slow growth, suddenly started shooting right on up. And the third is now on its way. And the fourth one, which seemed to be dormant the entire time, unless you look carefully, has actually had some deep, healthy green in the bulb just waiting for the winter sunlight. And who knows what the future will bring for it. And I can't help but think that we are a bit like these winter flowers. Some of us are eager to rise early, to greet the sun and to embody vibrancy and renewal even in the midst of winter. Perhaps we're even a little bit impatient with winter, ready to move on to the next season and all that it represents. We've had enough rest and hibernation and regathering and are ready to spring forward with all the energy that we possess. And yet others of us are more like the fourth bulb. We're not at all in a hurry to rise just yet. We'll bloom in our own time, but we're not there just yet. We're still blanketed in the winter snow, resting and dreaming. We are doing the hard work of preparing ourselves for rebirth. You may know that our Christian neighbors are about to move into the season of Lent, which begins this Wednesday and is a time of prayer, reflection, and repentance in preparation for Easter. Eastern Orthodox Christians refer to this season as the bright sadness, which as someone who doesn't particularly like winter and yet also embraces a few of its themes resonates with me. 
Bright sadness can also be translated as affliction that leads to joy, which resonates with me even more. And yet stepping away from Lent now, even I can admit that winter time is not an affliction, but in many ways a cure. Winter forces us to slow down in a world that is often too frantic with activity to let us truly pause or pay attention. When the snow came down on Thursday, I know that some schools closed, as did workplaces, even though there was only about an inch of snow. Some of us were able to study and work at home, others were not. These little slowdowns, these moments of rest, are so important. They are antidotes to the stress, the burnout, and the distractions that can plague our sometimes hectic and overcrowded lives. You know, Sandy and I were talking briefly about the service, just about some of the themes, and remarking on how you know, we both have friends who sometimes, when forced to slow down, find that they actually have a hard time when they don't have lots of things to do and are forced to kind of step back from things. They have a hard time just being with the quiet of their own thoughts. You know, we get so few opportunities sometimes to do that that we're not in good practice, and it can be hard. We need those times. And sometimes we're able to claim these little snow days for ourselves intentionally, and other times they are forced upon us. I'm reminded of an experience that I just had a couple weeks ago. As you know, Reverend James and I each take a Sunday off each month, and his is today, in fact. And while my February Sunday off was two weeks ago, and to my dismay, I spent at home sick with a cold. Sometimes it feels pretty unfair when sickness strikes on your day off. You should at least be able to get something out of it, right? Like a day off of work that you didn't already have off of work. But yes, my minor plague descended upon me not in the middle of the work week when I could have had a totally legitimate excuse to slack off, but on a day that I already had the right to slack off. I had, of course, been considering using my day off initially to go to the rink and get some errands and chores done, but against my will, I was instead forced to rest on the day of rest. And yet, I found that I strangely enjoyed my unexpected little Sabbath. Ignoring, of course, the mild, sniffly unpleasantness of a winter cold, it turned out to be kind of nice to be stuck at home. I was too sick to do much of anything, but not so sick that I couldn't savor doing nothing. It was one of those days when I got to just relax, not worry about any to-do lists or plans, and laze around doing nothing more productive than sipping tea and napping. And yet at times like these, sipping tea and napping actually is productive. It really is. Caring for ourselves is important work. Rest and renewal are vital to our ability to rise and to act and accomplish. Sometimes our bodies get sick and they make us rest. Sometimes it snows and things slow down just a little bit. And sometimes if we are wise, we intentionally build little Sabbaths into our lives, like rest days and days off, Sunday or otherwise. Some can be long, like a winter break or sabbatical, and others can be much, much shorter. For example, there is a sacred word that is important for all of us to know, and that word is, in fact, the word no. In her book of meditations, the UU colleague that I mentioned earlier, the Reverend Meg Barnhouse, talked about what waitressing taught her about setting boundaries around her time and her energy. And she wrote, the most helpful thing I grasped while waitressing was that some tables are my responsibility and some are not. 
A waitress gets overwhelmed if she has too many tables and no one gets good service. In my life, I have certain things to take care of, my children, my relationships, my work, myself, and one or two causes. That's it. Other things are not my table. Winter time is a time for conserving our energy. It is a time when it is important that we be aware, that we take inventory of our inner resources, like our focus and our creativity and our strength, and that we use our energy wisely. And winter is also a time, too, of cultivating our resources, of nurturing our spirits, feeding our souls, and tending to our hearts and minds, our bodies and our relationships, all of which together help sustain us as we move through our lives during the precious time that we have each been given here on this planet. I'm not a person who is great at this whole rest and renewal thing. During seminary, I once said something about resting when I'm dead, and then I promptly came down with pneumonia. <laughs> the universe called my bluff, and I rested. But as someone who is a bit of a gym rat, even I know the value of rest days. If you've ever strength trained, you know how important it is to take days off if you want to put on muscle. You know how important it is to not only put in hard work, but to also put down the weights every other day or so and eat so that your body can not only recover, but also grow stronger and store up resources for the next workout. My friends, two months ago, we came together here. We sang, we worshiped, and we passed around our four amaryllis bulbs. We held them lovingly in our hands, imagining what we hoped might grow in us, in this community and in the world as they grew. We prayed that they would rise from the soil with new vibrant growth this winter. We reflected on the work that we might need to do in order to bring our dreams to life. And we are now entering the last four weeks of winter. This is the time for final preparations for the approaching season. And if we want to rise up with the spring, we've got to first sit down and take some time to make ready. We've got to relax into the season and enjoy the winter just a little while longer. If we have not already, we need to take time to create time in our lives, just little snow days for rest and reflection and renewal. This is so important. It's got to be done. And we need to be attentive to and protective of our own nurture and care, especially if we are somebody who has been socialized to care for others. You're in your circle of care. Friends, as we proceed into these last weeks of winter, may there be times when stillness and silence blanket you like snow. May you find pockets of rest in which you can slow down, sleep in, and let go. And may these finer, final winter weeks bring you rest, recovery, renewal, and the energy eventually to rise with the spring. And now will you please rise in body or spirit and join in singing number 55 for our closing